Hi guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to the Rust Lang tutorial. This will be video five. So up until now, we've mostly talked about data in Rust. We've talked about things like structs and types and other things of that nature. Today, we're going to start to look at how we can control the flow of our programs. So we're going to look at conditionals, loops, and pattern matching. First, let's kind of look at the conditional operators that we have. Like many programming languages, we have equal to. And then we have not equal to, which is a exclamation point equal sign. Then we have greater than and less than. We also have greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. Notice I'm using ligatures. So of course, these will combine into symbols and stuff. But as you can see, when I split them apart, they are in fact keys that I've typed into the keyboard. So like in a lot of programming languages, Rust also has if statements. You can see here, we say if, and then we have a conditional. In this case, we're saying is n less than 5. And if this comes back as true, we run this branch of code. If it comes back as false, we run this branch of code. Now, of course, you don't need this else clause here. Like if I remove it, then what will happen is, say we have some code down here, it will just go through this and then it will continue on like normal. The else clause just allows us to account for things that do not meet this conditional. It'll automatically run this line of code and skip this line of code. So you can see here running the project will come back as true because n is less than five. So two is actually less than five, so we get true. We can also chain if else statements together like this. We have n equals six, and then we say if n mod four, so if n is divided by four and it equals zero, then print this line. Else if n mod three equals zero, then print this line. Else if n mod two is zero, then print this line. Else n is not divisible by three, four, two. You can see here we get n is divisible by three. We can also use if statements in bindings. So because if statements are expressions in Rust, we can use them with a normal binding. So you can see here we're binding a variable n and we're saying if c, so if it's true, then we bind 50 to end, else we bind 76, and then we print out n at the end. Keep in mind that the conditional here, if this does not resolve to a Boolean, then we're going to have a problem. So if statements always need to resolve to a Boolean inside of the conditional here. When you say something like if c, you're just asking whether or not c itself is true or false. And in this case, because it is a Boolean, true, we're asking if it's true or false. So if I turn this into false, it'll still work. But if I put in say like 10, we'll get an error. Other than that though, it's pretty useful to be able to bind variables based on a condition like this. Because it was false, we get n and then we get 76 back. Another thing you want to keep in mind is if you're going to use this type of variable binding, the types need to be the same. So for instance, this is an integer, this is a slice of string. You can see here that we're getting an error. And it's saying if else have incompatible types, that's because a uh, slice of string is not the same as an integer. So you can't use this for multiple different types because it could potentially cause unsafe code to occur. So let's look at our first looping structure. It's called loop. So this will uh, loop indefinitely and it will just print out infinite over and over and over and over again. You can see here as I'm running the project, it's just printing out infinite, just going until I hit control C to exit out of it. Now we can use loops that aren't infinite. We've added a mutatable variable called C. Then we have our loop block here. And we get inside our loop block, we print out finite, then we increment C by one. And then if C is less than 10, and this should actually say greater than 10 or equal to. So when C becomes 10 or greater, we run this statement, which is break. So this will automatically break out of the loop. And you can see here it prints finite out 10 times. Times. We can also label loops. So you see here we have three loops embedded in each other. So we have loop A, we have loop B, and we have loop C. And then we have print statements, one saying loop A, the other one saying loop B, and then one saying loop C. And the cool thing about labels is that we can actually use our break statement to break a specific loop. So in this case, what would happen is this will go through and it'll print loop A, then it'll go up to loop B and print loop B, and then it'll go up to loop C and print loop C. With the break keyword here, it'll break out of loop C and then it'll rerun loop B again and go back into loop C and then break out, rerun loop B and, and go back up to loop C. So it'll basically say loop A, loop B, loop C, loop B, loop C, loop B, loop C, and it'll do this infinitely. But we can actually say break loop B from inside of C and this will break all the way back out to loop A again 
and it will loop from A all the way up to C again. So it'll run A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. We also have a keyword called continue. Since we're breaking out of loop B, that means that we are actually going back to the start of loop A. I can type in continue and then I could say like loop A. And what this will do is it will automatically start at the beginning of loop A. And it will give us the same exact behavior that we're already having here. But you can use continues for things like, for instance, if you have like an if statement. So say like if true, then we'll just say continue. And what this will do is it will stop and check if true, and then it will continue. And we can say else break. And this type of logic can be pretty useful for various different types of loops. You can see here running this code, if we stop it, it is constantly looping A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, etc. We can also use loop statements as bindings. So you see here, we're saying let it x equal loop, and then we have a break statement, and then following the break statement, we have the value that we want to bind to x, so 10. So you can see here running it actually prints out 10 because it binds it to x. So another loop type that we have in Rust is a while loop. We're creating a mutable variable called n, and then we're saying while n is not equal to zero, print out n, then increment n, or decrement n rather, by one, so it'll subtract one from 10. And this will go from 10 till one, and then it will break out of the while loop. So while loops work while a conditional is true. And once that conditional becomes false, the while loop ends. You can see here it prints out 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and then one, and then breaks out. Finally, we have what are called for loops. You can see here we're doing uh, we're creating a vector which has 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 in it. For a number inside of A, which is this vector here, we're going to print out I each time we iterate through. So what will happen is we're going to iterate through the vector one item at a time, and then this item is going to be bound to I and printed out for each iteration. So you can see here we get 10, 20, 30, 40, and then 50. So say we don't have a collection, let's remove this vector and we want to iterate through something. Say we want to iterate a uh, hundred times. Well, what we would do is we'd say for i in, and then we create a range. And this is what's called an exclusive range, which means it goes from one all the way up to 101. So it doesn't include 101. Exclusive is double dots. Inclusive is three dots, but this does not currently work on this version of Rust, at least for for loops. You can see here, inclusive range syntax is experimental. This is something that will probably be added to the language later, but for now use exclusive ranges like this. You see here, if I run it, it counts from one all the way up to 100. So we talked about if statements before. Now let's talk about the match statement. So match is sort of like switch in a lot of other languages, except it's a lot more powerful because it's full pattern matching. So in this statement, this is exactly like a switch statement. We have a variable x and we're saying match on x, which means it will go through each one of these cases. So one, two, three, four, and five, and try to match our variable with the case. So in this case, it'll match with five, and then it will print out this statement here. So we also have to include this underscore here because Rust pattern matching is what's called exhaustive, which means that for all integers, we need to have at least one case. We have specific cases for one through five, and then we have a general case, which will catch all the rest of these integers. If we have like negative three billion, it will print out this something else case here. So as we saw before, it prints out five because that is the case that it matches. So you can kind of think of this like chaining together if else statements, but not quite. And I'll get into why here in a moment. So here's a much more complicated match statement. So you can see here we have a single statement one. So if n matches with one, we will print out this print here. Then we have this much more complicated statement here. And what's happening here is that we have multiple different cases uh, sitting together. So it's basically saying n matches with two, three, five, seven, or 11, then print out this is prime. Then we move on to the next case, which is a range from 13 to 19 and including 19. This literally iterates through 13 to 19 
and tries to match n with one of those numbers. In this case, because we do have 15, it will match with 15 and then it will print out 18. And then of course for all other numbers, it will hit this underscore and it will print out ain't special. So you can see here we get 18. So here again is a little bit more complicated pattern matching. You can see here we have a tuple and then we match the tuple based on one of the values of the tuple. This value here on the left is zero, then this case runs. If the value on the right is zero, then this case runs. And what we can do too is because this case runs, this y then binds to the negative two, and then it gets put into this string here. And if this case ran, then x would bind to whatever the value was here, and it would then run this string here. So you can see here we get y, and then we get negative two, which is the uh, number of the tuple. So this sort of allows us to destructure a tuple. And that's essentially what we've done here. So here we have what are called guards. You can see here we have these embedded if statements. So the way this works is we've got this tuple here. It takes the two values from the tuple and then it uses the if statement. So it tries to satisfy this conditional here. So if x and y equal one another, then this run. If x plus y equals zero, then we run this print statement. If in this case, because we have an underscore here, we ignore y and then we check if x mod two, so x divided by two equals zero. And in this case, it says x is even. With our pair here, it will match with this branch here. So running it, we get equal zero, which is the second case, as we mentioned before, it's this case here. So guards can be pretty useful if you want to further specify how you're matching your data. Here's another example of a pattern match. We've got a value p, which equals five. And then we match on p. And what we do here is we go through these two ranges, so 1 to 12, inclusive of 12, and then 13 to 19, including 19. And what we do is we uh, match 5, or P rather, so P matches in here as 5, and then 5 gets bound to N, which then is able to be used inside of this statement here. So that's what this is, this N at sign allows us to bind the variable to whatever the match is. And this is very useful, especially when we're doing a match on a value that we do not have ownership of. So it essentially allows us to clone the matched value. So we can use match statements as expressions, like with the if statement and the loop statements. So you can see here that I've sort of changed these print lines into just saying n. So essentially what this will do is it will try to match five, uh, or p rather, with one of these statements and then when it does matches it it will bind it to n which it will then pass to this side of the match statement so it will pass it back and then bind it to this variable n which it will then print out here so you can see here it prints out n colon and then five all right guys so i hope you enjoyed this tutorial if you liked it please feel free to subscribe and like if you have any questions or comments by all means feel free to comment and if you disliked it, then downvote it as much as you like. Hope you guys have a good night.